Uh, and as you're passing them over, um, in terms of reminders, uh, I think ev uh, hopefully everyone's done with the homework that was due today already. Um, if you have um, if you have a regrade request for exam three, you need to submit that on Canvas. It's under quizzes where the homeworks usually go. Um, if you don't submit anything, that's fine. You'll just have what you get. Um, and also, um, if you there's a second sec a second question there, a second essay question there, um, where you can uh, go through question by question on exam three, see what you missed, refer to the key for exam three, see what the correct answer is, explain what the difference was between what you put and the correct answer, and if you do that then you can earn back up to half the points you missed on exam three. Um, any questions about that, the thing due Friday? That's, that's due Friday, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, the, put the regrades. So that it's, a, it's a two question, two essays is the way it's set up. And so anything you think you want to regrade for, put that in question one. Anything that you think you got legitimately wrong, put in question two. Um, and if I don't think the regrade makes sense and I don't give you the points, then I might send you an email to make sure that you at least understand further like why you still missed the points or something like that. But you can still earn back the half credit if for things that you re requested regrades on. Yeah, uh, uh, other, did you have the same question or other questions? Uh, if you like, if you skip the question, can you still correct it? Yeah, you can just explain. I mean, if the if the reason is you didn't have enough time, you skipped it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you can still just explain what the answer is now. Um, uh, you know, uh, the key's kind of in notes, and so you might want to write a couple a couple a little bit longer than what's in the answer key, but explain the right answer, and you can still get half credit. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot of conversation. Are there questions people have that you're sort of wondering about with your neighbors about this? Yes. No. Okay. Um, also, uh, Sunday afternoon in Wien Hall, um, uh, review session for the final exam. Um, the, uh, the final exam topics guide is up on Canvas. It's very similar to what was up for Quiz 8 because everything's con con cumulative, um, as you saw with some of the questions on Quiz 8 just now. Um, the final exam itself is Tuesday morning across the hall in, in Doherty 2315. Um, you will need a calculator. Uh, you can use a cell phone app if you need to for that, but it needs to be in airplane mode. And you need to just keep it on the calculator and only use it for the problems that have calculators on them. Um, there was some Unit 1 stuff that had calculators, uh, calculators required, and also some of the homework that was due on Monday had calculator roots, uh, had questions that required you to have a calculator to answer them. Any questions about any of that? Upcoming stuff, final exam, anything? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so I want to, um, first of all, <coughs> uh, recap a little bit. Um, this was actually, I think, the last question on the quiz, but wanted to just recap again for everybody um, what goes on in terms of adrenaline signaling, um, particularly in the heart. We talked about adrenaline signaling sort of in abstract terms um, in Unit 3, and uh, in some cells, adrenaline signaling will turn on and activate proteins that turn on a certain type of metabolism or turn off a certain type of metabolism. Um, sometimes it can activate transcription factors that turn on or turn off genes. Um, unlike receptor tyrosine kinases, G protein coupled receptors only sometimes change gene expression, whereas receptor tyrosine kinases basically always change gene expression. And so that's why they were very, the RTKs, the receptor tyrosine kinases, were very critical in development. So you've got your adrenaline receptor and then your little adrenaline molecule. Um, and the adrenaline molecule binds to the adrenaline receptor. And hanging out next to the adrenaline receptor is this three-part protein called a G protein. Um, and in the case of adrenaline, it's got an alpha subunit that we have called alpha S for stimulatory, and then two other parts that never come apart from each other called beta and gamma. So beta S and gamma S. Um, and before the adrenaline shows up, there was a GDP hanging out on our alpha subunit. 
Then adrenaline comes along, and this GDP floats off into the middle of the cell somewhere, and it's going to maybe find an ATP and swap phosphates with it so it turns back into a GTP. But we don't really care about that GTP anymore. And instead, what happens is a new, um, a new G, fresh GTP comes in. Um, this has more free energy in it than the GDP. That was something that was um, a big deal in unit one. Um, but in this case, for this G protein, we're not actually using that free energy. It is useful to us as a GTP molecule just because it's a different molecule that happens to change the shape of the alpha subunit and change the way it interacts with the beta and gamma subunits and also change the way it interacts with um, uh, 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 adenylacyclase. Does that make sense? Questions about that? I think there was, there was a lot of confusion on exam three about the sort of like the GTP versus ATPs and so on. Okay, yeah. So then our, our alpha S subunit comes over and it binds to adenylylcyclase. And then adenylylcyclase starts grabbing hold of ATPs and converting them into cyclic AMPs. And the cyclic AMPs activate an enzyme called protein kinase A, so our alpha our alpha subunit is what goes over there, protein kinase A, and then in the heart, what happens is the protein kinase A will activate a sodium channel. Um, it turns out, I, to, uh, somewhat as with many things in this class, oversimplified things a little bit um, uh, on, on, uh, uh, on Monday. Um, it, it increases the amount of time the sodium channel spins open. It makes the sodium channel more likely to open, um, which is sort of becomes important when you get sort of deep into the physiology of cardiac action potentials. Um, but, uh, but to a first approximation, what this is going to do is allow sodium ions to flow into the cell because that's the way the concentration carries them. Um, and what is true about heart cells and neurons and other cells and muscle cells, any cells that fire action potentials, the more positive charge you get inside the cell, the more it's firing action potentials. And in the case of heart cells, that means the faster it's contracting. And the heart cells are connected to each other, um, plus they're all getting adrenaline, so your heart beats faster. Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so in different cells, the adrenaline, well, it's complicated. There are multiple different adrenaline G protein coupled receptors, some of which couple to other G proteins, some of which couple to GS, and some things that they do is they can shut down immune cells. Um, they can change the way neurons function. Um, and sometimes it's in very weird and complicated ways. Um, one of the reasons that um, uh, if somebody has severe allergies like to bee stings or peanuts or something else where they're at risk of anaphylactic shock, they might carry around with them EpiPens, which is epinephrine injections, and epinephrine is just another name for adrenaline. So you just quickly inject some epinephrine, adrenaline, into your body, um, and then that will speed up your heart rate, but it will also, and actually dilate your, 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 um, uh, your airways, which is actually part of the therapeutic aspect. But another thing that it does is it shuts down your immune system, um, which is useful from a flight or flight perspective because if I'm about to be eaten by a lion, I can deal with the virus that, is, that, I, that I've got running around in my body in about 20 minutes when I get away from the lion. Um, and so, um, but, but we then use that as a way to stop dangerous overreactions uh, in the immune system. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that why you get sick more easily when you're stressed out? Yes, absolutely, yes. I mean, yeah, when you're not, I mean, not sleeping has a big impact on that too. But yeah, stress, and actually cortisol, which is another hormone that acts a little bit differently, but is also associated with stress, is an immune suppressor. Um, we sometimes like put cortisone on our arm or something if we have a bee sting because we're trying to suppress the immune reaction there or a, or a mosquito bite or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, adrenaline's involved in that as well. Adrenaline and cortisone have different molecular function but sort of at a high level similar. Yeah. So does this kind of contribute to like, like somebody goes into shock or something after they get like really injured and they like don't feel the pain until like a while later because they're almost like, that's partially that. There's also part of that actually is endorphins as well, which can suppress pain. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, but the adrenaline, yeah, adrenaline does play a role in that as well, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is something that has been worked out and very well established and, as far as everyone knows, like, like um, uh, uh, definitely true. Um, I will say, say sort of like this is a widely accepted um, and well-backed up um, result or theory 
um, that's, that's backed up by a whole ton of experimental data and evidence. Um, and so as the title of this unit suggests, in last week and this week, we're going to be talking about some historical um, uh, 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 Events in science um, and different um, and different theories and the way our understanding changed um, and so with the um, uh, uh, acetylcholine receptor um, we're going to actually uh, see that that things are a little bit more complicated than what I uh, sort of laid out in the last ten minutes of class on um, on Monday. Um, okay, but still, so we've got our same heart cell. And, um, and like many, you know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm only focusing in here on now one receptor or another, but the heart cells have bunches of receptors all over them. Um, and so if we're looking at acetylcholine receptors on the heart, there again, G protein coupled receptors. Um, now we have acetylcholine, which is our little molecule that's going to stick to them. Um, and just like, or, you know, very closely analogous, to um, our adrenaline receptor, um, our G protein couple, our, our, um, uh, our uh, uh, acetylcholine receptor um, is G protein coupled. It has different G proteins. They're almost identical, but they are have a little bit of different protein sequence, which means that they are going to activate um, different proteins inside the cell. Um, but so before the signal was there, we had a GDP associated with the alpha subunit of our G protein. Um, and then um, when the signal from the acetylcholine comes in, our GDP floats away um, and is eventually going to maybe get, pick up an extra phosphate to become a GTP. And then we get a new, fresh GTP bound. So now we have our alpha I subunit with GTP bound to it. And then something happens that is kind of the question that we're trying to work out in this unit um, in this week, last couple class periods, where um, once this happens, you have a potassium channel that opens, and this potassium channel lets potassium flow out of the heart cell. As a result, positive charges are leaving, making the inside of the heart cell more negative in its electrical voltage. Um, and making the inside of a cell more negative will slow down the rate of action potentials, and for a heart cell, slows down the rate at which it's firing action potentials. Questions about that? That was mostly things that I discussed on Monday, and were even on the homework that were due on Monday. It was due on Monday as well. Yeah. Okay, so in order to study this, what we can do... Um, is we can take a little thin glass tube called an electrode um, that's filled with some solution, um, and we can attach that to the membrane of the cell and then rip away the membrane from the cell. Um, and so when we do that, I'll sort of reorient it a little bit like this, um, what we have is this patch of membrane, and inside this patch of membrane, um, we have our, um, our acetylcholine receptor, we have um, our alpha subunit, um, and we also have our um, beta and gamma subunits, and we also have our potassium channel, all sort of hanging out in this chunk of membrane here. <clears throat> um, and so as long as we have, so if we have um, up here in the solution up here, if we have acetylcholine in the solution up here, then that's going to bind to our acetylcholine receptors. Um, we need to have some GTP over here so that our alpha subunit, which might have a GDP associated with it at first, can kick that GDP off and get a fresh GTP. Um, and if we do all of that, if we put acetylcholine in on, so this is, this is, corresponds to the outside of the cell, this whole tub of solution that this thing's swimming around with corresponds with the inside of the cell. 
And so if we have some GTP available on the inside uh, of the membrane, or what part of the membrane used to be the inside of the cell, we have some acetylcholine on what used to be the outside of the cell, then we will activate this pathway and see electrical currents flowing through our potassium channel. So we measure electrical currents, and if we have acetylcholine out um, and GTP in, um, so we might have initially nothing, then we put on our acetylcholine and GTP, and then we get some electrical currents, and then maybe we remove the GTP or something like that, and then our electrical currents shut off. So this is zero current, and then this is some current, a few microamps or something of current. Does that make sense? Questions about that? So that's sort of the data, the kind of data that we're basically looking at here in this unit. <clears throat> okay, and so last time I talked about an experiment that Lutz Birnbaumer did, um, where what he did was um, he uh, added um, alpha IG protein that already had GTP associated with it. Um, and the result that he got was that he saw current flow. Um, and then in a separate, separate experiment, he added beta and gamma um, G proteins and saw no current. Questions about that? Does that, so that result? Yeah. Is there also GTP with the beta and gamma? Um, there is. It shouldn't really matter because if you have GTP floating around. So the question he's trying to ask really is, is it the alpha? So his idea is that the alpha subunit, once the GTP binds to it, just like the way the alpha subunit over there went and activated the dental cyclase, here the alpha subunit is going to go and activate the potassium channel. That's his hy hypothesis. Um, and that the beta gamma isn't involved in that. Um, uh, the beta and gamma subunits don't interact with the GTP directly, but as we'll talk about in a little bit, they do interact with, when, when alpha has GDP, the beta and gamma will stick to it. When alpha has GTP, the beta and gamma leave the alpha alone. Uh, does that all make sense? Questions about that? Okay, so, um, so uh, one question for people to discuss for the next uh, two minutes or so is, we consider in all of this, and in this model here, so his idea, um, so the idea um, that he came up with is that alpha plus GTP binds to the potassium channel and opens it. Thinking sort of from a, you know, why things are the way they are perspective, why, why, what is the advantage for cells to be arranged this way? Um, two related questions. First of all, why does the alpha subunit use this GDP versus GTP? Um, what is the function of switching GDP for GTP? That's question number one. And question number two is, what is the function of the beta gamma subunits in the adrenaline case and also in lutz birnbaumers idea for the acetylcholine case? So let's take like two, the three minutes, let's say, to talk about that with whoever's around you. Write down everybody's names on a piece of paper like you always do, and we'll turn that in at the end of class. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so when, um, so you've established that sodium in the cell increases voltage and makes the cell be faster. The potassium leaving has a negative effect on that. Yeah. So how does that work mathematically? Like, because uh, we were doing another formula in one of my other engineering classes. Yeah. The voltage, the voltage for, this, for that cell was determined by the concentration of the outside versus the concentration of the inside. The voltage, that, that tells you the voltage for the equilibrium potential for one ion. Um, so the equilibrium potential for potassium is determined by the, the, con the relative concentrations, which is the Nernst equation. Um, 
um, yeah, yeah. So, um, which, if you want to, after class sometime, we can derive the Nernst equation from Gibbs free energy. Um, and I can, yeah, it takes a little while to, to work through that. Um, but that is telling you the, the voltage you need to get at where, where you, the ion will be at equilibrium, where, because it turns out like, so for example, with potassium, if the inside of the cell is negative, there's diffusion force having potassium want to leave, but if the inside of the cell is negative, there's a voltage force pulling those positive ions in. And the, the question that the Nernst equation answers is what is that voltage have to be so that the electrical force pulling potassium in exactly balances the diffusional force pushing it out. And that's a different number for the sodium because sodium has different concentrations. And then the overall voltage of the cell is the weighted average of all of the, the ions based on how permeable the membrane is to each ion. Yeah. But we're thinking about one channel at a time here to simplify our lives a little bit. Right, no, because we just used the formula and I was confused because it turned out to be that the voltage increased when potassium left the cell because the concentration would be higher on the outside rather than the inside. The right. The voltage gets more negative. The voltage gets more negative when the potassium leaves. Yeah, yeah, and so that's true here like, here with potassium ions too, like um, with the journal with the acetylcholine. Um, uh, when, when, if the cell's sitting at minus 60 millivolts and, equilibrium, and, and, the, and the inertia potential for potassium is minus 80, then um, potassium will leave and the cell will get more negative. Right. Yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. yeah. Um, did you have a question? Um, um, is GDP exchange for GTP or is it phosphorylated? It's exchange. You get, as in a GDP hops off. As yep. in like, Alright, so the confirmation of the G protein and the G protein color receptor is like, is it like glued together by a GDP and that gets knocked off when it No, um, the GDP leaves and then the alpha changes shape so it no longer sticks to the, uh, to the beta gamma at another side. The GDP is not actually physically holding them together, but when the GDP leaves and the GTP comes on, the alpha changes shape and it doesn't stick to the beta and gamma anymore. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is a G protein a simple combination of alpha, beta, gamma? Yes. With the GTP or GDP, yeah. So there's nothing else besides It's those three, yeah, it's those three. Wait, would it be wrong to call it like a... I don't know if you could say like a negative feedback system, but like a feedback system in general. Like the fact that there's like the presence or absence of this is kind of like the baseline. For yeah. Or not the alpha is going to be attached. Yeah, that's, that's a reasonable like way to think about it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. So we've gone. We've actually gone a little bit beyond the three minutes that I said we would take for that, but that's okay. Um. So. Yeah. So first of all. What's the GDP and GTP doing? How are they sort of affecting the, the activity of our G protein? Um, what's the sort of job of the GDP and GTP in this? Anybody want to share what their groups came up with? Maybe, yes. Josiah, what did you all come up with? This? What did we all come up with? Yeah. What I came up with was that uh, GD um, TP has like a different shape, and so it changes um, the shape of the G protein, which uh, allows the alpha subunit to break off. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, so. Uh, GTP um, changes the shape of the alpha. Uh, G protein, and then so now the alpha breaks away from uh, the beta and gamma subunits. Does that capture? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what are the beta and gamma doing? What are the, what, why are they there? Uh, sure. Yeah. So they don't actually physically touch the GDP. Um, 
But uh, but um, I think the second part of what you said is right on uh, is right on with how people think about the beta and gamma subunits um, and how Lutz-Birnbaumer's model for the beta and gamma subunits uh, is. So if I can just sort of rewrite that, the beta and gamma subunits um, maybe prevent the alpha from doing anything. Is that is that kind of the idea that you had? Okay, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So this is this is how Lutz Birnbaumer and and, and uh, other people thought about the function of the beta and gamma or so, uh, the, uh, of the G protein and the beta and gamma subunits and the alpha subunit and so on. Um, there's his picture again if you want to see that. Um, the data that we looked at last time was um, uh, was showing that um, when he had alpha sub i that had GTP bound to it, that's what this little asterisk represents, then what he observed is that as he added that alpha to the, um, to the, the surface on the inside here, when he added that alpha to the surface on the inside here, then he saw current flow. That was uh, sort of what, um, so you can add, so first you can add acetylcholine out and GTP in, and you get that. Um, but then, so if we have, again, our patch of membrane um, with, all, really all we need for this is the potassium channel. And then for, for, um, for uh, lutz Birnbaumer, when he takes alpha sub I, GTP bound to it, and adds that on, then what happens is you go from no current to seeing current when you add the alpha GTP. And so the idea here is that beta and gamma subunits are just this sort of regulatory subunit that helps to keep the alpha out of trouble when there's no signal around. Keeps the alpha from making the opening these potassium channels when there's not a signal around to do that. Does that make sense, that idea? Yeah, sure. Isn't there a thing like uh, adrenaline in size place that uh, alpha I reacts to? Um, alpha I can suppress adenylocyclase 2. We're going to skip past that, but yes, th there's a lot more going on. Yeah, yeah, your hand was up too. In the, in the adrenaline trans, uh, transduction pathway, if we remove the beta and gamma subunits, yes. right, but there were, let's say we left the GDP attached to the alpha I subunit, then it would still not activate adenylocyclase. Correct. So why was... Why were the beta and gamma subunits involved in that case if it would only be worth Right. Great question. Another way to say that is actually something else that we can do is we could add alpha sub i plus GDP on it. And if we do that, we get no current. Is that part of the same experiment? Um, that is something that, uh, that yeah, he, he did in another part of this paper as well. You, there was another question over there. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. These are both great questions that are getting at exactly the thing that is the next thing on the list to talk about, which is David Clapham, um, another scientist who thought that, um, that this, uh, he thought that this is sort of silly. We have two regulatory mechanisms. The GDP regulates whether or not the alpha can bind with its uh, target, with its effector proteins, and the beta gamma everyone thinks is regulating things. And so he thought that this was just wrong, um, and that we should get rid of it. Um, and so, so you know, this is right. The alpha changes shape, and the alpha breaks away from the beta gamma. Fine with that. But the beta the idea that the beta gamma subunit is is a regulator of the alpha is something that he thought was just incorrect. Um, and to sort of um, test this and establish this, he did essentially exactly the same ap ap um, approach. Um, but what he did, um, uh, so again, we have a patch of membrane. There's our potassium channel here. Um, and now what he did is he put on purified beta and gamma subunits. And he saw that when he put on purified beta and gamma subunits, here on sort of draw a line like this. Um, he saw current flow, and then when that, <laughs> and then when that happens, and then when that, uh, and then when the current goes away, uh, or when the beta and gamma go away, um, the current slows down. Um, and so, and then he put on purified alpha and saw nothing, um, which is a little bit different 
Um, so first of all, I mean, like, yeah, surprising, confusing, doesn't make sense is what we've been talking about. Um, a little bit different, so if you think back to the last week when we had some surprising results, um, there we had different experiments that people were doing, and those two different experiments led to results that had sort of a, a weird, uh, it took a while to come up, actually it didn't take too long for you all to come up with, but for, for scientists it took six years, even though for you all it took about six minutes, to come up with a theory to explain the, um, uh, the stuff last week. Here we actually have like two different labs doing the exact same experiment, and one of them gets a positive result when they add alpha GTP. The other gets a positive result when they add the beta gamma. Um, and there was a, an incredibly fierce, angry, yelling debate, literally screaming and shouting at each other and calling each other sloppy scientists. Um, um, oh, yeah. Burn. Um, and... Uh, um, I'll uh, um, back and forth about this. There's, there's um, up on Canvas. There's uh, a, a, a short, one-page, uh, one-page letter published in a public journal um, that Lutz Birnbaumer wrote, um, where he. Um, this, these are actually some of the tamer passages here. Um, uh, he, uh, he, like, he basically says like the citations are sloppy, and I think he smells bad too in the in the publication. Um, so uh, it's it's worth reading if you want if you want to see scientists getting mad at each other. <laughs> um, what's that? Yeah. So anyway, so there was there was there was like six years of like yelling at each other going on about this issue. Um, the yelling business was, was maybe not necessarily all that productive all of the time. Um, but it turns out that there, um, so back to like this quote that's from the front of the syllabus here, um, the, the, the act of criticism, even when scientists get very angry and are maybe not so um, rational in the way they're pursuing these criticisms, um, there actually was some value that ultimately came out of this criticism. Um, and the, the value, in large part, um, deals with s s some sort of more technical aspects of how the experiment was done. So the way that you do this experiment, um, I think it was mostly frog hearts that they were doing this with. Um, and so you get a poor little frog, you take out its heart, um, and you grind the heart up in a little, um, uh, uh, in a little test tube. Yeah, it's not fun to be a, fro a lab frog. Um, although, you know, you anesthetize it first so they don't really know what's going on and then they're gone. Um, but, so you've got this mess of, of all sorts of proteins from the frog heart. Um, you've got this sort of like s this big sloppy mess of all sorts of frog heart proteins, and some of what's in there are some alpha I proteins, and s the betas and gammas always stick together. So, um, and even when you grind up the heart, the betas and gammas stay stuck together. So we've got some s uh, a whole mess of proteins and some alphas and some betas and gammas in there, <clears throat> and then. Um, what, the, what, what people did, what, what Lutz Birnbaumer and David Clapham did in their initial experiments was to try to purify um, whichever subunit they were interested in. Purify the alpha or purify the beta gamma subunits. And so to purify, what you do is you start with this mess of heart proteins, um, and then you, if you're trying to purify the alpha, then you sort of try and go through this chemical procedure, excuse me, chemical procedures where you get rid of pretty much everything but the alpha subunit. Um, but the problem is that, that any kind of chemistry is imperfect. Um, and that's kind of what's supposed to be um, um, uh, represented by this graph here. So any kind of uh, chemistry, chemical purification, biochemical purification is going to be imperfect. Um, and so whether, whether it's imperfect because we're trying to purify alpha and we end up with a little bit of beta gamma, or alternatively, we start out with a, with a mix of both. And 
we're trying to purify the beta gamma, but um, we only get rid of most, but not all of the alpha subunits that are there. Either way, there is a possibility that after uh, uh, that, that we're going to have a not completely pure final so, final solution that we're at, that we're applying here. And so, um, so here, for example, with this, the beta gamma, this has been purified from heart muscle. So, if that's, if that's what's going on, then the question is, not necessarily, at this point we probably don't have enough data to answer the debate about whether it's the alpha subunit that binds to the potassium channel or the beta gamma subunit that binds to the potassium channel. Um, but, um, uh, but one way or another, at least one of these experiments is flawed. And so the question for like the last four minutes of class is to write down and think about what is, given what I've just described about impurities, um, why might these experiments not be perfect, um, first of all? And second of all, in a general sense, what other kinds of approaches might you want to take to... Um, to come up with a way to answer this question without this risk of impurity. So why is this risk of incomplete uh, purification a problem? And then second of all, why it, how do we, um, in, in a general sense, uh, um, what, what, what would be our ideal arrangement or our ideal chemical that we would want to answer this more definitively? So let's take the last three or four minutes of class Work with your group, write that down. Um, I'm going to read those at the end, uh, over the next couple of days, and then we'll start with a discussion of that on Friday, which will be the last day of classes. Oh yeah, I'll take those, yeah. <laughs> 